Well, good morning. Good to see all of you this morning. Question for you really quick as we get started this morning with the message. Uh, anybody here tired of waiting? Anybody tired of waiting? Some of you are like, waiting on what? Well, let's just think about it for a second. Think about during our lifetime how much time we spend waiting. Think about how much time living as a resident of Lubbock, Texas, you spend waiting at red lights. Like, I think it would be interesting to do a study over the course of an average lifespan, how much time we spend waiting at a red light. How much time we spend waiting in doctor's offices. How much time we spend waiting to get into a bathroom that's crowded. How much time we spend waiting at the DMV. Anybody been there lately? Yeah. How much time we spend waiting uh, at theme parks to get on a certain ride or uh, at a concession stand at a, at a big event to get a, a certain food or at the grocery store or at restaurants. Think about when you go into a restaurant, especially here in Lubbock, and you get put on a wait list and you have to wait to get your table. I know all of you have a certain amount of time. You're like, no, if it's greater than this, I'm not waiting. I'm going somewhere else. It always reminds me anytime uh, Amy and I go out to eat at a restaurant and we have to wait, whether it's 30 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever it is, it always reminds us of back in a time when we were in college. Uh, it was a Texas Tech football game, actually, and we had gone to the game with some friends of ours. Uh, I was in physical therapy school. It was a, a buddy of mine in, in school and his wife, and after the game, we had decided to go eat, and so we went to a restaurant in Lubbock, and as typical for a typical game day restaurant experience, we uh, had an hour-long wait once we got there. And of course, we were in college. It didn't bother us back then, right? So hour-long, fine, except we were starving. And so my buddy, and you need to know something uh, about my buddy. Uh, my adversity to risk level is low. Like, I don't, I don't like risk, okay? I'm married. I have teenagers. I try to lead a church. That's as much risk as I can handle, okay? My buddy's risk level, like, he, he would do anything, I remember one day when we were in school, we were in the, the cafeteria, we had just eaten lunch, and on the table where we were eating, there was a bottle of Tabasco sauce, half full. And he said to those of us at the table, five of us, uh, how much money would you give me to drink that bottle of Tabasco sauce? We'll give you everything we've got in our pockets. He took the Tabasco sauce, chugged it. We dug in our pockets, we had a dollar and 29 cents. <laughs> this is just what kind of risk he takes. So we're in the restaurant and, and we're waiting for an hour and right around the corner from where we're standing to wait to get a table, he sees that this table is open. No one's sitting there, no one's been sitting there for quite some time. And so he says, come on, let's go. Well, I think he means we're leaving the restaurant to go somewhere else, so I follow him. He goes around the corner, and we sit at this table. We've only been waiting in line for like five minutes. We sit down, and within a minute, this very pleasant waitress comes and says, can I get you something to drink? Yes, you can get us something to drink. This is great. I always think about that when we go and sit waiting for a place in a restaurant, which is why a lot of times we choose not to sit down at a restaurant. We choose to go through a drive through right? Because it's supposed to be so much simpler in a drive through and so much faster in a drive through We've been in this series called 40 Days of Prayer. Would it be okay to ask this morning if we sometimes compare our prayer lives to going through and ordering food in a fast food restaurant? You, you know what I'm saying? Like, we just pull up to the little thing and say, God, here's what I want, here's my order. And we pull around and we expect to just hand it in our car and, and we take off, right? Like that's, that's how we expect our prayer lives to work as well. Of course, we all really know how ordering food in a fast food drive through works, right? And you, you pull up and, and the lady or the guy says, can I take your order? And you order, and this is what we do in prayer, right? We'd say yes. Uh, I want the promotion at work that I've been waiting on that has the bigger salary, but please cut the pain or any extra effort I'm gonna have to get to get there. And, and, and then the person comes back and, <laughs> right? You know what it's like to go through a drive through That's what it's like to hear God sometimes, isn't it? And then we pull around to pick up our order at the window and we think it should be that simple. 
and we hear the words, can you please pull forward and wait for your order to be ready? The reality is that that's what our prayer life is like more than we want it to be, right? That we have to wait. And God answers prayers in different ways. Sometimes he just says yes, yes. This is yours, you can have it, whatever you're asking, yes, this is yours. Sometimes he says no, it's not the right thing for you, I've got something better, no. Sometimes he says, are you kidding me? No, I'm just joking, sometimes he says, Wait, wait. Yes, it's the right thing, but it's not the right time. Yes, it's possibly a good thing, but it's not possibly the right time. Sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no, sometimes he says wait. We love the yes, right? Yes. The no, we struggle with. We struggle when God says no to our prayers. We talked a little bit, well, we talked a lot about this last Sunday. In fact, if you missed the message, you can go back and catch it at aldersgate.online. But sometimes God says no. Now, every parent understands why God says no sometimes, right? Because as parents, we have to do that. When they're little and they discover fire for the very first time. It's amazing, right? They just want to get closer. They want to touch it. They want to experiment it with it. They want to feel it. And we have to say no. Why? Because we know it's dangerous. It could be harmful to them. It could hurt them. When they get older and they start learning that Reese's peanut butter cups are better than vegetables, and they want to eat Reese's peanut butter cups before dinner, we have to tell them, no, you can't do that because then you'll fill up and you won't be hungry for what's really good for you. They continue to grow and Sometimes they want to hang out with people in places that we know is not good for them. And we have to say, no, you, you can't do that. No, you, you can't play your Xbox game 16 hours a day, right? We, we have to say no because while they can't see that it's not good for them, we can see that it's not good for them. Even as they get older, no, you don't need to buy that car because you'll have a payment that doesn't give you any margin in your finances, God's the same way with us. Sometimes he has to tell us no because while we think it may be right, while we know without a doubt it's good for us, God knows it's not the best thing for us. There's a story, if you've got a Bible, I can take you several places in the Bible today. There's a story in the book of John, chapter 11, where Jesus raises a man named Lazarus from the dead. And Jesus gets the news that Lazarus is sick, and he intentionally stays where he's at for a couple of days instead of going to tend to the request to heal Lazarus immediately. <coughs> Lazarus was a good friend of his, as were his sisters Mary and Martha. And by the time he shows up in their village, Lazarus has died. And Martha comes out to meet Jesus, and she's pretty upset with Jesus and says to him, basically, look, if you would have been here when we called you, this would not have happened. Lazarus would have still been alive. In fact, hear her words, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's in uh, John chapter 11, verse 21. <coughs> Jesus goes on to the place where Lazarus has been placed in the tomb. And there in the tomb... He raises Lazarus from the dead, but here's what he says in John chapter 11, verse 42. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. You see, sometimes God says no because he knows what we're asking for is not the best thing, and he actually has something better in mind. Martha wanted Jesus to come and heal her brother. Jesus knew the best thing was to raise her brother from the dead so that all would believe. God says no sometimes because he knows what's best for us. And sometimes God says, wait. The good thing, not the right time. Wait. If you find yourself this morning at a place of waiting with God, 
that you've been praying for something, you've been asking for something, you've been wishing for something, you've been hoping for something, and you're in this waiting place with him. I've got to share with you this morning, you're in great company. Noah was told by God to build a boat because God was going to flood the earth. Noah set out to build the boat, but he had to wait 120 years for it to rain. Abraham was told by God that he was going to have a son in his old age. He had to wait to be 25 years even older before he would see that son. Joseph waited 14 years in jail, doing time for a crime he did not commit. David waited 20 years between the time he was anointed as king of Israel and the time he was appointed as king of Israel. Elijah prayed seven times in 1 Kings before the rain came. Daniel waited 21 days for an answer after he began praying. The disciples, after Jesus had risen from the dead, said to them, wait in Jerusalem for the power of the Holy Spirit to come on you. And today, every single one of us sitting in this room, wait for Jesus to come back and set up his kingdom here in a new way. I don't know about you, but sometimes in life I get to the place where I'm like, God, I don't want to wait anymore. Just come today, right? You've got teenagers, I pray this prayer once a week. Just come. Come quickly. You know what it's like, right? But we wait. And the question becomes, what do we do in the waiting? What do we do while we're waiting? When we haven't heard no, and we think God has us in a holding pattern or a waiting pattern, what do we do in that time? What do we do to wait? Two things, we trust and we obey. We trust and we obey. For those of you who grew up listening to choirs sing songs, we trust and we obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. While we're waiting, we trust and we obey. How do we trust in the waiting? Number one, we keep praying. We keep praying, we keep praying, we keep praying, we keep praying. We take comfort from uh, stories like that of the persistent widow in Luke chapter 16, who kept asking and kept asking and kept asking. We take comfort in stories like that of Bob Goff. Those of you who know Bob Goff, he's wrote the book Love Does. If you haven't read it, go buy it. It's a great, quick, easy, inspirational read. He's got a new release coming out next month called Everybody Always. It's incredible reading. Bob Goff is an attorney, but you gotta know part of his story is he was not a good student and he bombed the LSAT. But more than anything, he wanted to go to law school at the University of San Diego. And so he made an appointment to go and visit with the dean at the University of San Diego and said, look, I haven't gotten an acceptance letter. I haven't even gotten a rejection letter. But all you have to do is tell me to go buy my books. The dean said, sorry, I can't do that. So every day, Bob Goff went to the dean's office and sat outside his office on a bench. And when he would see the dean come and go, he would say to him, look, all you gotta do is tell me to go buy your books. Every day, law school started, Every day he continued to show up outside the dean's office and say, look, all you gotta do is tell me to go buy my books. On the fifth day of law school, the dean walked up to the bench where he was sitting and said, go buy your books. Just keep praying. That's how we learn to trust God. We keep praying. See, we <coughs> often pray like cheetahs. You guys know cheetahs, right? Like the, one of the fastest mammals on earth. It can run up to 70 miles an hour. It can get there in four seconds. But to be able to do that, God created it with these fast twitch muscle fibers. It was designed to be a sprinter, not to run marathons. So what you may not know about cheetahs is that when they set out to catch their prey, if they don't catch it quickly, they give up. Because they fatigue, they tire out, they can't continue the hunt. Oftentimes you and I pray like cheetahs. Man, we're on it like gangbusters there in the moment. Man, God, we're, I'm, man, I'm on it like fire. I'm, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. Day one, day two, day three, we don't see an answer. We begin to fatigue and tire and give up on the hunt. Give up praying. Trusting God means that we keep praying. 
because God's got something for us in the process of praying. You see, it's not the answer that's the most important thing, it's the process that's the most important thing. It's not the destination that's most important, it's the journey that's most important. And oftentimes the reason God tells us to wait is because he wants to do something in us along the journey or in the process. And he says, wait, but keep praying, keep trusting. I mentioned Elijah had to pray seven times. You'll find the story in 1 Kings chapter 18. I'm gonna read just a bit of it to you this morning, starting in verse 42 of 1 Kings 18. It says, so Ahab, that was the king, went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. He bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. He was praying for it to rain. His servant went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And Elijah said, go again. And he did this seven times. And on the seventh time, his servant said, behold, a little cloud that looks like a man's hand is rising from the sea. Man, would we give anything to see that today here, right? Keep praying. Elijah said, go up and say to the king, you better get ready because the rain's coming. And in verse 45, it says this, watch. And in a little while, the heavens grew black, the clouds and the wind, and there was a great rain. In a little while. You and I don't like a little while, do we? In a little while. Keep praying, keep going through the journey, keep trusting God. Anybody ever do that experiment in school or maybe you're a teacher and you had your kids do this experiment? I remember this in elementary school where you would take a seed and you would plant it in a little cup, right? You had the potting soil and you would put the potting soil in and you would put the seed down in the potting soil and then you would take the cup and you would set it on the window seal and you were responsible for watering. Anybody do this? And as a kid, you remember how disappointed you were every day you showed up and nothing was happening? There was no plant that was coming up out of the soil, nothing even green for day after day after day after day. Nothing was happening. That's how it feels in our prayer life sometimes, doesn't it? That nothing is happening. We pray and we look day after day after day and nothing is happening. But what we didn't know is because we couldn't see it in that little cup, something was happening. The seed was germinating. It was getting ready to sprout and break the soil above it, right? Just because God doesn't appear to be working doesn't mean he's not working. Just because God seems to be quiet doesn't mean he quit. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean God's not up to something. Keep praying, keep trusting, keep praying, keep trusting. Daniel had to pray because he was in trouble. You'll find this in Daniel chapter 10. He prayed and It took 21 days for his prayer to be answered. His prayer was answered in the form of an angel showing up to Daniel. And there's something really important that the angel tells Daniel. It's in Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. When he finally arrives on the day 21 and and speaks to Daniel, he says, Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God. Your words have been heard and I have come because of your words. Daniel didn't know what was going on those 20 days. What was going on was that there was a battle between the angel and the demons. But Daniel didn't know that. But God was up to something. He was working, he was moving. And just because Daniel couldn't see it didn't mean God wasn't busy. Keep trusting, keep praying, and obey. When we're in the waiting, we have to obey. Well, if God's not telling us anything, how can we obey? We can obey lots of different ways. Let me just share a few of them with you this morning. Number one, we can pray and we can obey and and we can know that there is always something to give thanks for. 
When you're in a waiting moment, when you're in a waiting period, when you can't see what God is up to, when you don't know what he's doing, don't focus on what you don't have, focus on what you do have. When you're waiting for something to come through in your marriage, don't focus on what's not in your marriage, focus on what is in your marriage. When you're waiting for something to come through with your kids, don't focus on what's not there with your kids. Focus on what is there with your kids and give thanks to God every single day for those things. When you're waiting for something at your work and you can't see what God is, not, what God is up to, don't focus on that. Focus on what God is doing. Same thing with your church. When you're upset about something, when you don't like something, don't focus on that. Focus on what God is doing there. Be thankful for what God is doing. 1 Thessalonians verse 5, 18 says, give thanks in all circumstances. Be a happy camper, not a whiner in whatever circumstance you're in, whatever situation you're in. When you're waiting, you can give thanks. Here's another thing you can do. You can worship. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are imprisoned. They freed a demon from a girl whose owner, a slave girl, whose owner was making money off the demon. Paul and Silas freed her from the demon. So obviously the owner wasn't very happy with that, so they threw Paul and Silas in jail. Acts chapter 16, verse one, here's what we read. At about midnight, Paul and Silas were worshiping. They were waiting, of course, for God to come through, to set them free, to let them out of prison, and in the meantime, they worshiped. They were singing songs. They were singing hymns, it says. And about that time, God sent an earthquake. You can read the rest of the story in Acts chapter 16. Worship. In the Psalms, we read this. Psalm 30, verse 4 through 5. Sing praises to the Lord. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Keep singing. Keep Worshiping. The third thing I want to share with you this morning you can do if you're waiting on God, if you're in a waiting period, is to serve. Look, it's real simple. If you're waiting, do what waiters do. Serve. Find a place that you can get plugged in. Find a place that you can serve others, whether it's in your work or through your church or, or whatever it is. Find a way that you can serve. That story of Joseph, Joseph who had to wait 14 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Do you know what he did during those 14 years of prison? He served, and he kept serving, and he kept serving, and he kept serving. Trust and obey. We all find ourselves in those places of waiting. When we get to those places, trust and obey. Keep praying. Ask God to show you what he's doing in you through the process or through the journey. And obey. Give thanks. Worship. Serve. I want to end this morning by showing you a story. It's a, it's a, a story, it's an incredible story that we've put together through video that talks about perseverance in prayer and finally getting to see the answer. Check this out. I grew up, my mother was a, a devout Catholic. She went to mass every Saturday evening, it was a Spanish mass. And I, I would go with her when I was younger. I'm not sure exactly how old I was, about nine or 10 when my mother stopped going to mass. And she, she just said the church, they judge you faster than anybody else. That was my mindset after that. You know, why go to church if they're just gonna point their finger at you? Growing up in poverty, you see people doing good, you see, somebody with a nice car, and jewelry, and being popular. You kind of want to be like that, at least I did. And the only way to really get like that in my neighborhood is if you sold drugs. And so that was a, a quick outlet for me to be able to make some money. And I started pretty early, unfortunately, selling joints in junior high. And by the time I was in the ninth grade, I was selling cocaine. Ended up catching a couple of cases. Before you know it, I was, uh, I was sentenced to a 20 year sentence at the age of 19. At 19, I, I never had a father figure around, so I pretty much was raised in the system. Became a man in prison. I, I did six years, I made parole. I got out, I got me a good job, met my wife, started a family. Uh, things were going great. And a few years down the road, you know, the struggle hit. 
I lost my job, my wife lost her job. You know, naturally I went right back to selling drugs. And it's as if I didn't miss a beat. I was right back in it. And before you knew it, I got pulled over one day and I knew it. I called my wife, said, hey, they're pulling me over. I'm not coming home. That night when I got arrested, you know, I did like, like my mom did. I got on my knees and I prayed. At that time, it felt like just a shot in the dark and just cry out. I knew I wasn't getting out, but I, you know, Lord, if you get me out, I won't do this no more. I started reading and praying, attending services. Aldersgate would come out and uh, bring a video, and, and I started getting some understanding of the gospel. I committed my life to Christ. I got baptized by, by the Aldersgate group that would come out. They would hand out these prayer cards and put your prayer request on the card. I would pray for my lawyer, pray for the, my case. It seems like the, the, the more I prayed and the more I, I dug into the scriptures and, and the more I seemed more free. I had some things in my case went in my favor, but we still had to wait. Went to a evidentiary hearing. My lawyer presented a case and the, the state has presented their case. And it took the judge five months to rule. When he ruled, he ruled in our favor and the case was dismissed. There's no other reason to explain that but God. My case was dismissed. They were offering me 30 years in prison and I was incarcerated for three years. The Aldersgate group came in and said, hey guys, uh, if y'all could pray for Roberta, she needs prayer right now. We were, I didn't know who Roberta was. Who is Roberta? Well, Roberta's one of the ones who prays over y'all's prayer requests. So I made a vow that I would pray for these guys because we get prayer requests and they'd be written on sheets of paper that I would spend three hours a week praying for them. I remember one, I remember lots, but there was one name that kind of stood out because he was so serious about praying for his family, kind of like knowing he had done wrong and he wanted to change. And I don't know why, but it just stuck. And his name was Fabian Madrid. I was asked by Chaplain Perry from the Love County Detention Center if I would go with him to, to Aldersgate and to just give a short testimony on, on how the volunteers can make a big impact. I, of course, I'd never seen Fabian. They got up there and were talking, and this one guy stepped out there and he said, my name is Fabian Madrid, and I went, that's my Fabian. <laughs> After it was all over, I thought, I have to tell him that I was one person, I know there were others, but I was one person that had been praying for him. I remember uh, coming down from the stage and this sweet lady said, Fabian, is that you? And so I, I put it, tapped him on the shoulder and I said, I'm Roberta Patterson. And he said, I know your name. And I said, dude, he says, yes, they told us that a woman named Roberta was praying for us. And he said, and he started crying and so did I. And he said, you don't know what a difference that made. And her prayers were answered. So many other people's prayers were answered. And to be able to just sit here and talk about prayers is a big thing because I have people that I know that I pray for now that I, they, they're lost. They don't believe. And my prayers for them is that they would come to know God and, and, and have a relationship with Christ. And once they do that, their, their mind will be blown. They, they'll have a, a different understanding.